Rachel Willis Sorensen, who is playing Desdemona in the LA Opera production of Otello. I'm glad we could have a chance to talk about predominantly this opera, but a few other things as well. And I want to ask you about about your uh, sort of how you what your mindset is before you arrive at a, at a theater and before you get onto a show. And I'm wondering how much does the philosophy expressed um, in Bird Set Free by Sia, where she says, sing for love, sing for me, resonate with you as you're beginning your approach to going on stage. Did you get, did you listen to my radio show I did in Germany? Is that where you get this? I do my research. Oh, I see. That's so nice. That was actually hilariously challenging. I mean, I, at first they just said, come up with 10 songs you love and talk about why. And I thought it would be an informal uh, conversation, but then they said, no, you have to, you have to go ahead and lead or it's just you speaking and 10 tracks playing for over an hour of like solid German. It was very intense, <laughs> but I love that song. My daughter actually showed it to me, Bird Set Free by Sia. And it's so beautiful. I don't care if I sing off key. I found myself and my melodies. I sing for love. I sing for me. I let it out like a bird set free. And I, that's what it feels like to me when I'm singing. Like there's this incredible freedom of expression and that somehow the context, everyone is sitting there looking at me and it's like I've been given the platform to express myself and it's just the most incredible feeling. It's, and to me, there's something more valuable in expressing something honest than in doing it perfectly. I, I've been varying degrees of a toxic perfectionist all my life and I think with singing, the best performances I've ever given, I would never say they are the ones that were the most like technically perfect. It's more the ones where I accessed something very real and shared it with the audience. That's where I feel the most reward and fulfillment. Well, it's interesting because I've seen some of the videos that you've posted on your Instagram account. And I think one of the best piece of advices you give is, is don't try to be someone other than yourself, because when you tap into who you are, that's what's going to make it unique. And that's what's going to make it something people are going to respond to because you're giving so much of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And somehow the conventional wisdom offers a different perspective than that, that we should all be honing the craft to become more homogenized or something. I, I just don't agree at all. I think that leads to like generations of very dull artists who aren't expressing anything real. And then maybe they can do it with great aplomb or I, I don't know, I went to something recently and I heard such beautiful singing from actually a friend of mine. And I thought, that's really beautiful singing, but it seems to me the only subtext you have is I'm the greatest singer in the world. And that's kind of boring. That didn't, doesn't move me. That doesn't move me. You know what I mean? Personally, like everyone is entitled to their opinion. That's mine. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that's the curse of shows like American Idol and America's Got Talent, where the minute somebody does some nice phrase, the whole world has to suddenly erupt in applause. And if you're, if you're trying to feed that machine, then yeah. or if you think that's the standard by which you're going to be judged. I think we're setting ourselves up for just really dreadfully boring art. I think you're absolutely right. Well, let's talk about the art of Otello and the character of Desdemona. This is your third production, I believe, of Otello. That yes, I did the same production a couple of times. And the first production that I did, I will do again in October. Um, but this is the third production and the I would say maybe the fifth visit to the role. So how much does a production itself influence your approach to the role? Well, that's funny you should say that. I'm finding that each nuance that I learn from an old production sort of informs the next one. And since it's only my third, I mean, who knows? But it seems if you're asked to look at something from a different perspective, potentially it enriches your viewpoint on the role. And then depending on the flexibility of the director or the amount of time, you can really hone something. I think it's never identical. There are no two performances that are identical, but some things, for example, the first production I did was very traditional. It was actually, I am terrible that I've forgotten the name of the director, but he worked at the Globe Theater in London. So he was coming from this like very theatrical Shakespearean traditional perspective. And the, the production was very much like that. And I loved that about it. I think making a role debut in a production like that is a gift because you're just doing the show. You're just telling the story as well as you can, which is always ideal for a role debut. I understand why people potentially want to go a new place with a piece because they think it's boring. Maybe they've seen it too many times. I tend to disagree. I think the more honest it is, it's really worthwhile to see. And it's never the same two times, even in the same production. If you see, anyone can tell you that who's seen two different casts in the same production, it's a different show. 
you know. But in, in in any event, the second production that I did was very modern and in Munich, and the take on the character was so different. And I find that the strength of presentation from the second has informed this third one significantly. So now this is more traditional, but I think that my telling of Desdemona has become a lot stronger than it was previous to the second production. You also, you know, sang four arias on your album, Rachel, which of course was recorded after your Strauss album that came out, if I'm remembering. It's correctly. true, chronologically. Chronologically released differently, but recorded in the, in the, in the other order. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, you, when you've had a role debut and then you get to explore it in another production and in a record where you don't have to worry about staging and things like that, how does your perspective and your relationship with the role change over that time? Well, I feel, that's funny you should say that. I think after I worked on... So the first conductor I worked on the whole piece with was Bertrand de Billy, and he gave some really interesting perspectives that I think about a lot now, particularly in the Willow song that she repeats these these themes over and over, you know, slightly different words, but like they're, they're just these these repeated melodic passages. And the first time there you like stop and wait and listen and the orchestra just plays a single note and then the second time they echo what you've just sung. And it's it's like he taught me to have the sensation that it's a, it's a satisfying thing. You don't sing the words, cantiamo, cantiamo, we sing, we sing, until you hear the orchestra echo back. So it's kind of saying we are singing together. I don't know, it's funny. It's like this little, I don't know necessarily that has a deep significance emotionally, but that's such a nice thing that I look out for every time now. So I, I think similar to the productions, every time I work with a new conductor, I have like a new way of doing certain things. James Conlon, for example, talked a lot about the Holy Three, that very often it goes, there are three bum, 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 three chords in between every entrance. There's three, three sounded pitches. And very often does Damon's part is working with three words. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, is it possible? I'm so sorry, thank you. Um, anyway, that that's something I'm always looking out for now. So Verdi will write a phrase with three repeated notes and they're all accented. And that's somehow a, an important leitmotif of, of the opera Otello that I didn't notice before James Conlon pointed it out. So anyway, you always, it's always developing through time and learning how to do it better and better. Well, James Conlon is a passionate fan of Verdi's. I've spoken to him about his passion for Verdi. And I think he discovered Verdi when he was a teenager and just mm. feels like it's as good as you, as it gets when you get to, to perform Verdi. Is it, are you that passionate about Verdi as well? Absolutely. I mean, I love music generally. I love singing. I'm in a very fortunate position where I get to sing a wide variety of repertoire, probably wider than is normal to do, you could argue. But um, Verdi is certainly, at least, if not my absolute favorite, then somehow among the top two favorite composers to sing. It's just written in such a grateful way. And the, the characters are always really interesting to play I, I i i just love it it suits my throat i find singing verdi feels very physically satisfying and very often you die in the end which is nice <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a weird well, way i mean it makes you really think about your own mortality to die on stage it makes you more grateful to be alive but also the act of doing this it's just, somehow i don't know i almost recommend it as a therapy like enacting your own death physiologically like going through that and then trying to lie there still trying to if if i had to count the number of minutes in my life i've spent worried that people could see i was breathing I, it's so funny like i don't think that's normal <laughs> but that's part of my job to say okay breathe in a, how can we breathe keep the rib cage expanded and only breathe beneath it so that no one can see that you're you're not actually dead <laughs> well, we don't want you to really be dead. I mean, we are watching theater. I know, but theater. I don't want to spoil the spoil the the magic. Well, so, since you brought since you brought that up, I'm gonna I will just jump ahead to something I wanted to ask you. You know, the <laughs> audience is led to believe that Desdemona has been killed. Otello right. believes that she is dead, and then so, and then she, and, and then she comes back to life, and I. <laughs> you know, to sing her final passage in the opera. How do you navigate something like that? Because it's a tough thing to pull off. I think it may be one of the toughest things to pull off because it's a shock both to the characters on stage and to the audience. Well, I remember the first time I heard that from the audience, 
and by the way, I was so arrested by Otello the opera, and it was incredible. The cast was incredible. Johan Botha was Otello, and Renee Fleming was Desdemona. So <clears throat> that was my first experience with the piece, and I just remember in that part thinking, "Is she a ghost? Like what? Like what is happening exactly?" And I don't know. It's not. Uh, it's not very logical. Like I don't. Maybe it wasn't common knowledge that it takes three to five minutes to choke a person to death. It's terrible. But I think what I think is he's just knocked her unconscious. But also clearly like something is physically wrong enough that ultimately she dies from it, but she comes to for a second after the fact. So it, not spoiling it for the audience is rough because you don't want to move, but also like sometimes it's your second chance to move if you die, because since I die in this production in a physical struggle, I have to get into a position that enables me to sing at all. If, for example, my face is in the rug, it's a no-go. So, and that's interesting about this production. They've done away with a bed. So I die on this rug rather than smothered to death with a pillow, which happened in both of the other productions I did. Um, but after the physical struggle, I don't want to think, I don't want to be thinking about how I land. I want to be thinking about struggling in a realistic looking way. And we have the, our little tricks, like how I'm holding. He chokes me to death with a rosary, which is such a gross and sort of powerful image. It's particularly because it's the same Rose Rose play, praying for him with mere moments before. But um, I, I'm actually holding it. So it's not even touching my throat, but we, we have to struggle, make it look like he's choking me to death. Anyway, there are all these things, but I want that to look as real as possible. So I tend to just land in whatever way. And then it's sort of a gift. You get this next line because you can readjust because you're not actually dead, right? But I, I don't know. I know it's illogical, it's difficult for the audience because she's dead. She's not dead. She Wait, is she dead? I know it's very strange. But <clears throat> and that, those moments I have to think kind of technically because, for example, Conlon has insisted we don't do any portamenti in the end, which I thought, well, if you're dying, you would, it would it's hard. singing without portamenti is a little bit, takes more support, more <clears throat> cleanliness. Your onset has to be like very... It has to be so clean that that actually requires a great deal more control. So the fact that you're like lying there, to me, it read the opposite. At first I was doing it in this really swoopy, like I'm dying way. And then I said, no, 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 I want it as absolutely clean as possible. So that's what I'm trying to focus on during those moments. And then I just try to not breathe visibly for the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I and I could tell that you were holding the the rosary because you don't want to choke yourself or l even come close to choking yourself, particularly when you still have more to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like live the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I want to ask you about something that Sonia Yancheva said in 2015 about this role. She mm -hmm. said Desdemona is a strong woman who knows exactly what she's doing. The only thing that escapes her is the level of craziness attained by Otello. I personally think she's very brave. Her greatest strength is her love for Otello. She defends her love, her man to the very end. Now, history has not really viewed the character that way. They viewed her more as a tragic victim. Where do you find her? Where, which, which side of this coin is she? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to be more a bit of column A, a bit of column B. I think she's strong in that she marries Otello against her parents' wishes. So she's, and she's somehow emotionally healthy enough to believe she didn't have a poor relationship to her parents she didn't escape them to marry Otello they didn't want her to marry him and she was so in love that she made this decision to stand by him and run away with him I mean that's represents some I mean that's some kind of chutzpah right who does that that's it's kind of crazy so she's not it, it, I think if she had been a wishy-washy sort of bland character a beige person she wouldn't have been able to find the strength to make that decision but her love for Otello is so big and his specificity, his difference from all the other men she's interacting with, I think is part of what contributes to that. But it's also, I don't like the idea that she's just merely a weak, tragic, vic she is a tragic victim. I mean, that, that is clear. She, I just don't see her as weak because I think it's too easy to say that only weak people become the, the victims of abuse. I don't think in the real world, that's how that plays out. I think anyone can. When when your tenderness is taken advantage of by another person, in whatever way, that could that could basically happen to anyone. We it takes so much to be able to stand up to an abuser if they are someone that you love. So I think it's a very relevant story. I think it's a story that I've seen, not obviously to the extent of murder, but play out in my life, in my friendships, 
Like I know plenty of people who've been there and it's so I tend to agree with Sonia in that Desdemona is actually a strong character, but I don't know. I mean, and I think that's the other thing. She has to be a tragic victim. We have to feel like it's a terrible mistake. It's a terrible misunderstanding and that Otello has done something very wrong. The interesting thing is that somehow we don't, anyway, my experience as an audience member with this piece, I don't hate Otello. I don't think, what an idiot. You just really hate Iago. You think Iago did all of this. So somehow Verdi manipulates you to almost, well, to, at least to understand why Otello would murder his wife, which is so not okay, even if she were cheating <laughs> with Cassio. Oh, anyway, no, that's funny. That's an interesting, that's an interesting thing. But I think the main message that makes this worthwhile in a modern context is that even strong people can easily become the victims of abuse. I also think there's something even more topical than that, which is the whole idea that lies take on a truth of their own. You know, we live in a society where let's just, you know, let's call election denying what it is. I mean, you repeat something yeah. often enough, you get a huge percentage of people to believe you, you know, and social media is a hotbed of complete and utter falsehoods. And I think that there's a cautionary tale in Atella, which Shakespeare knew at the time that he wrote the play, that tells us what the problem is when we start believing everything that we're told. Yeah, someone was saying, I was having a discussion recently about how woke culture is, is difficult in an opera context. And now there is a, what I think was brilliant, they, they had an intimacy coordinator on this production. It's the first time I've ever worked with one. And actually what I found was so helpful is that he said, don't do that, that looks stupid, do that, that looks better. And I thought, oh my gosh, how nice to know from the outside, like how something is reading what makes it clear? And that I thought, wow, I, I think that's a big ask for a director, apparently. I Ideally, they'd be able to do that, but very often they don't. Um, but anyway, we were talking about how someone suggested it's enough just to have an accusation. That's enough to ruin you. Just the accusation. There doesn't have to be any proof. There doesn't have to be any investigation. As soon as an, an accusation is made, that's it. And I think that's kind of what you're saying right that they're like once a story is out there it can get traction and it can do terrible damage that's that's really you're right that is another part of the story that's really relevant and really terrible yeah because we live in a culture where you are guilty until proven innocent now gosh i i've been teaching my children i have three little children a nine-year-old daughter and twin sons who are seven they are almost eight and my my son was saying to someone um, it's okay if you like something and I like something different. We can both like different things and still be good and be okay and be friends. And I was so proud <laughs> that we don't have, we can have divergent opinions and not be accusing one another of stupidity. That's a beautiful notion that I'm trying really hard to teach my children. I think that's really missing in public discourse, this notion of divergent opinions not representing conflict. Well, I think we've also, you know, the I think we're at a, as a society we're at a point where listening is a lost art. Hmm. Well, we better bring it back. You and me. Well, that well, that's to me that's the beauty. That's the beauty of you know being able to turn off your cell phone for those who go ahead and do that at at a concert or a production of an opera or a play or anything else. But that we get to have a a vacation from all the extraneous noise that we're constantly getting pummeled with. It's like, I, for one, love the idea of uh, the lights go down and I don't think about the outside world. Oh, then I'm singing for you. I want <laughs> that, that's what I want. That's what I want the audience to do, to step with me into this new world temporarily where we're gonna feel things and experience this story together. That I think that's really what I'm looking for, having that experience together. Cause it is, there is something so special, particularly now after the COVID nightmare, when we sang, I sang sometimes, luckily I had a couple of things that weren't altogether canceled, but they would just be filmed with no audience and broadcast. Singing to no audience is an entirely different experience. So enjoying that sensation together in the room, the audience is a really important element of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's a good thing that uh, hopefully you're enjoying this experience since you are coming back next year to die again. Yes, to die again, <laughs> a Verdian death, a Verdian soprano death. 
yeah, I uh, how exciting. This is my debut at this house, although I came here in 2014 and did Operalia and won. You that didn't, was such I was going to say, you didn't just do Operalia. <laughs> you slayed the competition. <laughs> you slayed the competition. I got first prize and the Tarzuela prize and the Birgit Nilsson Wagner Strauss prize. It was a good night for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't been able to be back since. I also sang once in the Hollywood Bowl, but the, it was a long, I was even a long time before that. So to be back, finally making my debut with the company proper. And then it's been such a wonderful experience. I love the atmosphere. I love working here. I love the way everyone was. And Conlon is so marvelous. And it's just been a great experience. The costume people, everybody was so lovely. And so how thrilled am I to come back next year and do another one of my most favorite roles, Violetta Valeri in La Traviata. Now I noticed that on your, I believe it was on your, you have on your, you have a Twitter account, I believe. Uh, I do. And you R. asked w. for Sing. you asked for restaurant recommendations because it had been so long since you'd been in Los Angeles, and I didn't yeah. see that anybody responded unless they unless they DM'd you. A lot of people DM'd me, and people sent messages on um, a lot on Instagram. I don't know. I don't Twitter. I think what happens is so I, my press agent. Typically, we produce content and she will release it on all of the social media as the same content. So, but I think Instagram has the the biggest traction. So but anyway, I got I did get quite a few recommendations. If you want to make one, I'd be I'm all ears. You know what? Um, I'm a vegan, so I'm not necessarily the right person to ask. Hey, well, what's your favorite vegan restaurant? I'm not against oh, that. Um, it is Crossroads. It's on Melrose, um, near not far from the Beverly Center. Um, cool. It is really high end vegan food and it is truly spectacular. I took my, I, yeah, I took my um, dyed in the wool, you know, carnivore brother there. And he said, if vegan food tasted like this all the time, I'd be a vegan. See, I love that sort of thing. Yeah. So back to Otello for a moment, mm -hmm. um, or any opera for that matter. Can you tell when you're in a good production versus when you're in one that isn't working as well? Yes. Yes. I've been wrong a couple of times, to be fair. I mean, no one's perfect. But um, generally, when the story is discernible, it's legible, so to speak, from the audience perspective, it's going to be a good production. If it is not, then it's going to be a concert with some weird, confusing nonsense happening in front of the audience, which <laughs> is not my favorite, obviously, given that I described it that way. But I mean... It's hard. I don't envy a director the task of trying to coordinate all of those multitudinous moving parts. I do think we need to be holding them to much higher standards in general. And and is this stage easy to work with? The you know the the this this bow shaped stage that you're on because I I look at it and I I look at several of the characters who have to go up and down and back and forth and I'm thinking by the by the by the last half hour of the opera they must everybody must be thinking oh my god how many more times do I have to do this <laughs> well I mean it is more challenging for us but I think it's definitely worth it because it pitches all the action toward the audience I think you experience the story in a different way so the thing that I love most about this production is just how cognizant the original director was of the audience experience so we're just trying to tell the story and and he made he there's some creative choices yeah like the bowl it's just very theatrical so it feels kind of like from a different time in a way which it is I don't know when the production debuted but it's not new but I think there's something so wonderful about that just taking into account the audience experience that they that they see the things that they hear the things I mean Oh, how nice, how refreshing is that? This little sort of hat tip at the past. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about the past as it collides with the present in terms of the role of Otello. Mm -hmm. Clearly a lot has changed in the last four or five years. Yeah. And what was once acceptable in opera for this role is no longer acceptable. Your other Otellos were not black performers, black singers. Does it make a difference to you not that they are black per se as an individual, but when you are working opposite someone, does it make a difference to see an actual black man as a tello singing opposite you? And do you think it's important that that continue to be what is done on opera stages? Um, so I will say that I just, I have loved working with all of the tenors that I've worked with. They've been very impressive and interesting and storytellers 
I think that Russell also is an incredible storyteller. I think he has experience to access in order to tell this role in a different way based on being an actual black man. So when he talks about being a black man among white people and how he, fe I don't know how much of that they even, I think they water it down for the super titles, but um, it's like something that he is able to tell in, an, in a different way. And he's very passionate and he's in a wonderful colleague and singing with him is a joy. Um, I don't, I'm not really in a position to say whether or not that's only informed by the color of his skin, but I do think it's a, a I'm I, sorry, this is a hard subject. Okay, here's where, here's what I feel. I'm not entitled to have an opinion on the controversy because I am a white woman, right? But I do think that opera itself, what differentiates opera from other art forms is the singing. And at any given time in the world, there may be five men who can do the role of Otello, right? Even at all. So to make their skin color be requisite that we will just never get to do the piece. I think Aida is the same. If you do Aida, you can only do it. There are, there are actually a few really wonderful African descent singers who could sing Aida really well and they should do it. And for that reason, I'm nervous about undertaking that task myself, even though it's been offered a couple of times, because I don't want to be part of the controversy. I feel like when we don't acknowledge the color of the the intent of the composer that the color be of the skin be darker it's sort of it seems like you're acting like the struggle doesn't exist so it's just it's just such a complex issue it just doesn't have an easy answer in the productions i've done where we all together ignored it it's fine it's we're still telling a story about jealousy there are a lot of things it just becomes not an issue of race so I guess you can see much more clearly the question, the issue of the racial dynamic if the tenor is actually black. So I think that it's worthwhile doing in either way, but this does definitely make this particular production of Otello extra special. Well, yeah, and, and I, and it, you know, I don't think it's just about the skin, you know, the color of Russell's skin. It's the life experience. It's his artistry. It's, it's his artistry, but it's also the it's life artistry. experience that he's had. You well, know, that, in my opinion, that, is that's definitely very, one and the same, you know? It's a, yeah. One informs the other. One informs the other, absolutely. All right, so I'm going to ask you one last thing, and it's it's something that Verdi wrote in a letter in, in 1871 to Giulio Ricordi, where he said, I deny that either singers or conductors can create or work creatively. This, as I have always said, is a conception that leads to the abyss. If you had the opportunity to either refute or concur with Verdi, what would you tell him? Oh, I, I'm going to have to give this some thought. I'm not sure what he meant, what he was responding to. That sounds like a response to some sort of assertion he disagreed with. But, but I, obviously, is, I don't, I don't have the context. He, in that in in that letter, he he says that he said this a lot. Um, you know, because he said, you know, as I have always said, you know, it's it's such we a, don't create. It, Oh, yeah. meaning that the composer creates and the singer just recreates. Is that what he's saying? We I'm just, not, you know, it's it can just it, follow the But it's the whole idea. It's score. not even just create, but work creatively. If 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 conductors and singers don't work creatively, how does his work come to life? I think it's No, I don't I guess I don't agree then. Yeah. Sorry, I think, Verdi. I, love you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I tend not to agree with that because I think if that's true, and I say I always say this if there were only one right way of doing it just record it and have done but we do it again and again the beauty of the live experience is one thing but I think the diversity of experience with different casts I felt that myself in different casts if someone is sick and you have a replacement the show is a different show the experience is a different experience I'm trying to think what is something that I've seen the same production with three different casts I think it's the Traviata in Munich it's just such a different show with a different cast every singer brings themselves into what they're doing so i would say i would argue you have to work creatively you can't just but on the other hand maybe what he meant which i do agree with is that you follow what is written on the page and you will make magic we don't have to create magic we get to make the magic that verdi already wrote down on the page i do think his articulations the expressive markings the the tempi the dynamics there's room of course for rabati there's room for naturalistic interpretation but most of that information is already on the page and when you follow those guidelines in a naturalistic way you tend to do better than if you go rogue and ignore them well said 
Well, thank you very much for your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation.